Sarah, do you want to answer some questions? Sure, yeah. I have them. So I can see that, I can say, let me add mine into the chat. Um, taking care of that whole self. So when we're at home, if you're at my house, at least, I have children, I'm taking care of grandbabies, trying to homeschool things that I normally wouldn't be doing if I was at the office. Um, and so that self-care is very important, getting out, walking, jogging. I've joined Camp Gladiator. I've joined a gym. I'm just trying to really focus on me and not allow everything that's gone on with us over this last year to impact uh, my mental well-being. And so I'm wondering, um, it looks like there's a, a comment in the chat that says uh, their dog is a great support. I've heard that a lot where people, you have, if they've already had animals or they're getting new animals, um, Some people are looking for tools to uh, help to get, keep, and maintain self-care. It's always good to add things to our toolbox um, because we don't know um, how much longer this pandemic will, will continue to go on and the phases, and it's always good. And sometimes in the field that we work in, we utilize the tools that we use for ourselves for helping the families, children, youth, adults that we may be working with in the community as well. So that's always great to have things in our toolbox that we can pull out, if not only for ourselves, but for others as well. Well, thank y'all for those that uh, gave input into the toolbox. So before we get started, Okay, can you guys, I apologize for this. Sonia has froze. So I'm not sure where she was <laughs> in introductions. She will be right back. And okay. while I wait for Sonia to come on, I believe I can take, take this away whilst we, we wait for her. How's your day going, Sarah? My day is going very well. Thank you very much. Um, I Hopefully it's a beautiful day. You know, it's just an early start. It was really uh, windy and, and a little gloomy outside this morning. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to the afternoon and this evening. So it'll be um, nice. Is that Michelle's picture I see behind you? It is. <laughs> nice. She's my spirit animal. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Well, um, our spirit you human. There, your spirit human, yes, more like it. And that's Obama, of course. <laughs> yes. And then Ruth. Oh, yes, I can see her now. So, what got you interested in this topic? Um, what brought me interested into this topic was my own personal experience. I thought it would be good for um, others to hear someone in their community that is open and honest and candid and am able to discuss it from a professional um, standpoint as well as a personal standpoint. And is this something that you've been doing for a long time? Uh, yeah, well, I've been in the field since 2003 and I have, I was, I've been in, <clears throat> excuse me, my allergies guys. <clears throat> I have been in recovery for 17 years now. Um, October 15th, 2003 was, is my sober birthday. Um, I'm a grateful recovering addict, 
my um, experience with mental health started when I was, I was diagnosed around 1994-95 with um, depression and obsessive compulsive disorder and anxiety, which is kind of all intertwined as almost like a symptom of the OCD. I see. Well, everyone, we are sorry that we lost our moderator. Uh, my name is Lady Jane. I am in the background working some magic, but I will get us all started right now. Thank you, Sarah, for Thank you, handling this so graciously. So folks, Sarah Billingsley is a counselor at the Austin Recovery Network and a research associate at Dell Medical School at the University of Texas at Austin. She holds a master's degree in social work. Now, if you all join me, welcome Sarah, and we will take a listen to her presentation. Thank you so much, Sarah. Hi, and thank you. Thank you for that introduction and welcome everyone to the importance of taking care of your whole self, mind, body, and soul while in recovery. Um, I struggled with how I was going to present this to everybody. So bear with me. We're in this together. Um, I have my cheat sheets and I'm ready to go. Um, I have handouts that I am willing to send to you once I share my information at the end. Um, feel free to take that down, reach out, and then I will send it to you. I didn't want to have to fuss with it during the presentation. So, um, excuse me. Also, for those of you that are familiar with Zoom, um, there's an opportunity for me to um, show a video panel where I can see myself as well as you all. So I wanted to be clear of that because when I pull it up, I'm going to drag it as low as I possibly can. But on your end, you may possibly see a little black box. I have checked over this and it should not be covering any of my presentation. I just want you to know that it will be there. So anyways, without further ado, we will go ahead and get started. So I will share my screen. Um, again, I've got my cheat sheets, so I'll be using those. And um, yeah, discussing substance abuse, mental health, and self-care, all um, while being in recovery myself. I am 17 years sober. Uh, October 15th, 2003 is my birthday. And yeah, I'm really excited to be here and, and talk about these statistics and what we can do differently and how we can band together and make a difference. And in that, I will be sharing my story kind of in between, but at the end, feel free to ask questions. Um, yeah, so we will go ahead and get started. So let me get that screen shared. I'm going to get the screen shared and then I'm going to put the video up. So hold on. Um, all right. All right. With that, so give me one second. Now, okay, I got my little video up. I don't know if you guys can see it. It's right here. <laughs> so I'm just going to hide it. Okay, great. Um, and then go ahead and get this started. Maybe. Ah, we want to play from the beginning. Let's get this to the beginning. Whoops. Sorry, guys. Technical difficulties. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Okay, let's try this again. Perfect. Okay, so let's go ahead and get this presentation started. Again, welcome. So glad to be here. Glad you decided to join me um, on this journey today. As I said before, I wasn't exactly sure how I was going to complete this presentation for you all to be most effective. I went back and forth with a few ideas and finally just decided on speaking my candid truth. 
and that is on what I know best. And that is being a woman, being a black woman, being a black woman that manages mental health, as well as being a black woman that manages mental health in long-term recovery, practicing to strive for a better self each day, mentally, physically, and emotionally. You can see on this slide here, I thought this was really powerful. I really enjoyed this. So I thought, why not? Um, and I love Maya Angelou. So I figured I'd put a little something up also. Um, so it's the fire in my eyes and it's the flash in my teeth, the swing in my wrist and the joy in my feet. I'm a woman phenomenally, phenomenal woman. That's me. <laughs> okay. In today's presentation, I will discuss the history of mental health in African-American communities, strategies for engagement, conversation regarding local and nationwide resources, excuse me, to help in advocating for change, share ideas and practices for self-care, all while sharing some of my own personal experiences. There will be time at the end for questions. I will share my resources and other information as I had stated before. Though I don't have, again, don't have the handouts today physically, um, I will send them to you if, if, if you so choose. So let's go ahead and get started. Ethnicity and Health in America series, Substance Abuse and Addiction in the African-American Communities. Drug addiction is a chronic disease defined by compulsive drug-seeking behaviors that has the potential for reoccurrence, relapse, and recovery. While addiction is a medical disease, it remains a stigmatized disease, which affects substance dependence research, prevention, treatment services, and legal policy in the United States. In 2015, almost a quarter of adolescents and adults in the United States, 66 million Americans reported binge drinking within the past month. In that same year, 27 million Americans reported dependence or misuse of illicit or prescription drugs, despite relatively uniform rates of substance abuse among racial, excuse me, racial and ethnic populations. There is a disproportionate rate of drug arrests for African Americans. In addition, members of racial and ethnic minority groups are most likely to experience barriers that impede their ability to assess substance abuse treatment. We must examine how to make accessible, retain, engage, and support African-American individuals who are seeking to end their substance dependency. During the month of February, we commemorate African-American Heritage Month. This month, the Ethnicity and Health in America series will be raising public awareness, excuse me, public awareness about substance abuse and addiction among African Americans. A lot of my slides are full of statistics. Um, I'm gonna go relatively quick. So of course you're not gonna be able to read it all. Again, I have no intentions not to share this later, so just let me know. I just think that um, addiction and mental health is, um, it, it's very near and dear to me, clearly, and I think that is important to see it just as much as hear it. So, um, yeah, I wanted to put in as much information as I could without it being too overwhelming. <laughs> so anywho, um, all right. So the African-American community has a statistically higher percentage of substance abuse than the general population. The following are some of the reasons for the high rate of addiction in African-Americans. The inferiority complex resulting from the poverty of the urban areas that many African-Americans inhabit, the high concentration of drug and alcohol sales in African-American residential areas, the apathy towards 
education that keeps many African Americans trapped in liter illiteracy and poverty, the lingering Jim Crow prejudice that prevent African Americans from obtaining jobs that pay them as well as white Americans. The drug use of African-American role models who seem unafraid of white rules or oppression and use violence to maintain a fearful respect of others. And the cultural expectation of white Americans that African-Americans will drink heavily, abuse drugs, drain resources, and hamper society. Lastly, the despair of being a part of an oppressed and marginalized social group whose human rights seem to have reached a standstill. As long as the African-American community is left in this rut, the issue of drug dependence among them will never improve. So let's talk about the differences between white and African, excuse me, white and African-American drug addicts. Addiction specialists cannot afford to use generalized approach, a generalized approach for all of the patients or clients, however you call them, as African-Americans face many challenges foreign to white addicts. Members of the white community usually begin their addictions because of the following reasons, among others. The stress resulting from pressure to excel, the desire to escape a painful life, um, or the fun with their friends that claim that drugs, excuse me, the fun their friends claim that drugs bring. Um, while in African-American communities often have a different relations or have different relations with the drug world, including the following situations, living dominant by drug lords who control their families with debt, um, needing to sell drugs to supplement their family's inadequate income, Emulating their African American role models who are feared, feared fighters and abuse drugs regularly, seeing drugs regularly, abused and easily obtained in their communities. Those working in African Americans, those working with African Americans in addiction recovery, like myself, must know about the African American experience in order to administer effective healing therapy. There are ways to approach addiction in African-Americans. There are therapists specializing in African-American recovery treatment that may utilize the following strategies. Presenting recovery as a way to redeem, redeem the ancestral slavery by breaking out of the addiction. Asking the patient or client what particular strength they pose and explaining how sobriety can help regain these. And, refer and referencing recovered African-American addicts, ensuring them that with help, any African-American drug addict can recover. So with that being said, we will then um, move on to mental health. So touched on a little bit about the addiction and now mental health. So um, I'll read this slide and then we'll move forward. Mental illness isn't a uniquely modern phenomenon. The genetic influences that stand behind some types of mental illnesses, along with the physical and chemical assaults that, <clears throat> excuse me, that can spark illnesses in some people have always been a part of life. But the ways in which impacted people are treated by their peers, as well as the help ill people might get from their doctors has undergone a significant amount of revision. In fact, the ways in which modern cultures both understand and deal with mental illnesses have undergone a radical transformation. However, much work remains to be done if people who have mental health concerns are to reach their true potential. And to say this as exponential, exponentially tough times for black people in America would be an understatement. And that's why protecting the mental health of this community is vital. The deaths of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and now Jacob Blake among countless lives lost 
at the hands of police brutality, in addition to simultaneously experiencing a disproportionate rate of deaths from COVID-19, have left many people of color fighting through psychological warfare. During this mental health state of emergency, Black communities are not only protesting, but many are also looking for ways to find peace. In recent times, attitudes towards mental health issues appear to be changing. Negative attitudes and stigma associated with mental health have reduced and there has been growing acceptance towards mental health issues and support for people with them. Despite this shift in attitude, the idea, the idea of mental health awareness campaign is not a recent one. In the late 1940s, the first National Mental Health Awareness Week was launched in the United States. During the 1960s, this annual weekly campaign was upgraded to a monthly one with May being the designated month. During this month, National Health America, the main organization which sponsors this event, run a number of activities which are often based on a theme. And in 2010, 2010, the theme was live your life well. Live your life well, encourage, encourage people to take responsibility for the prevention of mental health issues during the times of personal challenges and stress. Many mental health problems can be avoided by taking positive lifestyle changes and choices and how we act and think before they can manifest. To coincide with Mental Health, mental health Awareness Month, other mental health campaigns and activities also run during this month. National Children's Mental Health Awareness Day is one such campaign. This event is sponsored by the American Psychological Association, better known as APA. Other activities have included blogging for mental health and help for people seeking psychological services. As you can see the slide that I have up, Minority Mental Health Month. Mental illness doesn't discriminate by your background or race, but access to care might. You are not alone. NAMI, You Are Not Alone campaign, features the lived experiences of people affected by mental health to fight stigma, inspire others, and educate the broader public. Now more than ever, the mental health community must come together and show that no one is ever really alone. The campaign builds connection and increases awareness with the digital tools that make connection possible during a climate of physical distancing. NAMI supports all diverse backgrounds, cultures, and perspectives, reminding everyone that you are not alone. July is Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. Help us spread the word through the awareness, support, and advocacy activities. Share minority mental health awareness information, images, and graphics, hashtag minority mental health all throughout July and any other month, honestly. <laughs> America's entire mental health system needs improvement, including when it comes to serving the marginalized communities. Mental health conditions do not discriminate based on race, color, gender, or identity. Anyone can experience the challenges of mental illness regardless of their background. However, background and identity can make access to the mental health treatment much more difficult. National Minority Mental Health Awareness Month was established in 2008 to start changing this. Each year, millions of Americans face the reality of living with a mental health condition. Taking on challenges of mental health conditions healthcare coverage, and the stigma of mental illness requires all of us. In many communities, these problems are increased by less access to care, cultural stigma, and lower quality of care. African Americans are 10% more likely to experience serious psychological distress than any other race. Experts agree that these alarming statistics will only increase without elevated access to coping mechanisms. Mental health advocates like myself have become guiding lights <laughs> leading to the charge and uplifting the spirits of people of color and have provided best practices for surviving through these triggering, excuse me, 
<laughs> surviving through these triggering times. I am so tongue tied. I'm so thankful that I have this cheat sheet. Um, I, you know, I joke and make light, but I have, I mean, clearly I, I have mental health. Um, I manage my own mental health and have for years. I struggled prior to that. And, um, and now in a field where I can advocate and, um, and assist and support the best way that I can. So I'm very thankful to, to be here and very thankful to, to do that. So, um, making light sometimes is, um, part of it. So anyhow, um, moving on America's entire mental health system needs improvement, including when it comes to serving, serving marginalized communities. When trying to access treatment, these communities have to be, have to contend with, excuse me, language barriers, a culturally insensitive system, racism, bias, and discrimination in treatment settings, lower quality of care, lower chance of health care coverage, stigma from several angles for being a minority and for having a mental illness. These are all in addition to the usual roadblocks. Many cultures also view mental health treatment as a luxury, considering symptoms as a phase that will eventually just pass. These harmful perceptions of mental health illness, excuse me, of mental illness can further isolate individuals who desperately need help. I see this all the time in my clients and with what I do. Um, it, it's just, it's, you know, their grandmother or their great, great grandmother or great, great, great grandmother just wasn't talked about. It's not something that they did. It's, oh, you know, she just drinks a lot or, oh, she just mumbles. She's talking to herself. Well, it, it's a little bit um, more extensive. And because it is so hush hush and there is a stigma, it's not getting treated properly. And so by the grace of our higher power, whoever that may be for you, if you believe or not, regardless, um, life is improving on that end. And so we can only, we can only go up. Very thankful for that. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. Here's the next slide. So stigmas all too often keep people from seeking the mental health care they need and deserve, but even worse, some people feel those stigmas more strongly than others. African Americans receive mental health care at half the rate that Caucasians do, according to a 2010 study, even though both experience the same rates of mental illness. Many African Americans are skeptical of mental health professionals and their skepticism is understandable. Therapy has not always been accessible to African American communities, nor has it always offered quality, quality care. Even more mental health care professionals at times have set themselves against community support networks that many African-American clients rely on. A difficult history cannot be denied, but the future looks much different. More recent studies show that African-Americans are seeking out and receiving the therapy that they deserve. Mental health care is becoming more accessible and therapists are offering quality mental health care. I will say, and I tell my clients all the time, that um, Austin is the best place for resources, period. Um, you got to work at it and you got to stand in line and you got to make phone calls and you've got to, you know, do, do, do. But it's available for you as long as you take advantage of it and utilize it properly. It's helpful and it's there. Um, starting conversation about mental health in your community may feel very intimidating, especially if your community views mental illness as a personal fault or weakness. But the more we talk about mental illness, the more normalized it will become. Make sure, excuse me, make sure to stress the importance of a culturally competent provider. These mental health professionals integrate your beliefs and values into treatment. To find a provider that does this, 
you may have to do a significant amount of research. In addition to searching online, you can also ask a trusted friend, family member for recommendations, um, ask for referrals from a cultural organization like a fraternity or the NAACP, um, uh, and, and they can be helpful for the community. I've got some resources I'll show here also um, in a little bit. Um, when a person experiences mental health symptoms, one of the most important, excuse me, one of the most helpful and important and comforting feelings is knowing that you are not alone. It can be incredibly reassuring to know in this moment right now, someone else is going through similar struggles as you are regardless of where they are, who they are, or how they identify. So you can see that I have kind of gone through a few slides. I'll kind of go back a minute. Sorry about that. Um, so let's see. Talk, okay. So as I said earlier, I just want to be able to have this in your face so you can see it and you can actually wrap your head around it a little bit. Um, seeing is believing. And again, these numbers are from 2019. And though some of them are better, there are still some that are stagnant or worse for that matter, depending on the area that we um, African-Americans, brown people are in. <clears throat> This one, I think, really kind of stuck with me. I did want to touch base on, on some of these. So let me say this. Um, the information on these infographic slides, and that would be um, the slides that I have up, which are, I think, are slides 12 through 15. Um, and this page comes from studies conducted by organizations like Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, which a lot of us know as SAMHSA, or the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC and the U.S. Department of Justice. The terminology used reflects what is used in the original studies. Terms like serious mental illness, mental illness, or mental health disorders may all seem like they're referring to the same thing, but in fact refer to specific diagnostic groups for that particular study. So I kind of want to um, put that out there also, and that's why I wanted to touch on some of this ripple effect of mental health. It's so, 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 so important to um, get your mental health under control and managed because um, it's not only affecting you, but it's affecting those around you. And you could even, for those that may be pregnant that are struggling with mental health, could be also, um, what is it? What's the word I'm looking for? The, the energy and your stress, your baby feels that. Um, so there's, there's that too. Um, the ripple effect of mental health. So I want to say a couple of things. So person, so for yourself, um, which one stuck out? I wanted to read, oh, people with depression have a 40% higher risk of developing cardiovascular and metabolic diseases than the general population. People with serious mental illnesses are nearly twice as likely to develop these conditions. Uh, family. Caregivers of adults with mental or emotional health issues spend an average of 32 hours a week providing unpaid care. That is insanity. Oh my God, that's, too, that's just so much. Um, but if we could just get the people that we need to get to the resources and allow them to get them at a legitimate cost and not outrageous, um, that it's going to be effective and um, meaningful, this we can alleviate so much. Um, community. Mood disorders are the most common cause of hospitaliza hospitalization for all people in the U.S. under age 45, and that's after excluding hospitalization related to pregnancy and birth. That is incredible. I mean, People, oh, I, I mean, I could talk to people, I could talk to you guys for days about this. Um, it, it just breaks my heart that 
instead of allowing someone the proper resources, and I don't mean hospitalization, I mean um, therapy, medication management, if that's what they choose, holistic um, management, whatever the case may be, it's just, this doesn't have to be, this doesn't have to be guys, we're here to make a difference and we're here to do something about that. And that's why I'm here today. Um, and then a little piece on the world. So de depression is a leading cause of disability worldwide. And because of the African-American community and how it's a stigma and how we push things under the rug, it doesn't get managed and taken care of. It doesn't get addressed and taken care of and managed. So yes, our sisters and brothers will end up being institutionalized, hospitalized due to that. We can change that. We can change that. Um, here, so the next few slides, um, as I said before, just like random resources. Um, this one specifically talks about stressors on diverse ethnic racial groups, racism, discrimination, violence, poverty, mental health dis disparities factors. Members of the ethnic and racial minority groups in the United States face a social and economic environment of in inequality that includes a greater exposure to racism, discrimination, violence, and poverty, all of which take a toll on mental health. So it's like, it's just like this crazy cycle, crazy cycle. So how and when are we going to break it, right? We're going to band together. That's what we're going to do, band together. Um, the health crisis. So in 2018, for the first time in history of such research, the rate of suicide for Black children between the ages of Five and 12 has exceeded that of white children and more than a third of elementary school age suicide involved black children. That is disgusting and should not be. Um, it is up to us to, to teach and lead the next generation and to, to do better and to be better. And I mean, I, a five-year-old Committing suicide is unfathomable, unfathomable, fathomable. <laughs> you know what I mean. It's hard for me to believe. I, I just, it, it's just, it breaks my heart. Um, and that's kind of what, again, I wanted to put it on here. Seeing is believing that it, when I saw that it just like hit me. And so I wanted, I wanted to, to make an impact with that. Um, so the next piece is the representation matters. Only 6.2% of psychologists, 5.6% of advanced practice psychiatric nurses, 12.6% of social workers like myself, and 21.3% of psychiatrists are members of minority groups. I work for a company and I am one of three Black people. Three all female. I am in the um, outpatient program. My um, sister, co-worker, is in the inpatient program. And my other sister, um, co-worker, is she works overnight. So none of us ever see one another. So technically, we feel as if we stand alone. And that's not how it should be. And so I am very active in our uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity, uh, excuse me, diversion, equity, and inclusion um, uh, committee, which we just recently changed the name to the Equity Task Force, because equity includes all of that, equality and diversity, and we're we're at task. We're, we're trying to, to, to go to task and be forceful and make a difference and change our community and change our place of business and open our arms physically and virtually so that people know that we're there. 
um, and we're with them. Um, and so then that takes me to the community stigma. In research, research studies, Black people have indicated that mild depression or anxiety would be viewed as crazy in their social circles. Many of those interviewed also believe that discussions about mental illness would not be appropriate even among family. I deal with it all the time, all the time. And I'm sure you all have probably dealt with it in your place of business personally, excuse me, professionally, of course. Um, so that concludes that portion um, as far as the mental health goes. These next several slides, very overwhelming, but they are resources specific to Black people in our community, locally, nationally, internationally. Um, one that has, I figured I'd read one or two off of each page. Um, so for instance, the Black Mental Health Alliance provides information and resources and a find a therapist locator to connect with a culturally competent mental health professional. And that's one of any color. However, 99% of them are black. And I know that only because I've been a part of that um, um, organization for some time. Um, let's see, the Black Women's Health Imperative Organization advocating, excuse me, advancing health equity and social justice for Black women through policy, advocacy, education, research, and leadership development. Here's another that stuck with me, brother, you're on my mind. Um, an initiative launched by Omega uh, uh, Phi Phi fraternity, and basically. It's allowing, it's raising awareness and allowing other Black brothers associated with depression and stress, et cetera, and their families to come to get resources from them to spread the word um, and to be able to support one another. Uh, melanin and mental health connects individuals with culturally, culturally competent clinicians committed to serving mental health needs of Black and Latino Hispanic communities, promotes growth and healing of diverse communities through its website, online directories, and events. This one here, I liked, well, I liked all of them, but one specifically was the POC, Person of Color, online classroom. So it contains readings of importance of self-care, mental health care, and healing for people of color and within activist movements. So it's literally just multiple classrooms and classes and courses and resources. It's, it's just, it's something that when we're going to go into self-care, this next piece, it's something that you could, um, part of self-care is reading, right? So it could be something that you choose to do while working on your self-care. At the same time, you can um, retain, obtain, retain information that you can later utilize in um, that cycle that you're breaking, right? So um, Black Mental Health Resources, Black Therapist Rocks, Love, love, love that website. I just came upon it in the last few months and I think it's incredible. Um, it's literally like a black person directory, therapist directory. Um, it's great. Really, really like it. You can put in what you're looking for and it will narrow it down for you. For those that aren't familiar with psychology today, it kind of reminds me of that a little bit. Um, and you can also put yourself on it as well if you're a therapist. Um, and then ThriveWorks, they have specific groups targeted for African Americans due to the increased population here in Austin. I think that's a great, great resource. And the Hogg Foundation for Mental Health. Um, uh, I do some research studies. Um, I work as a research associate with the University of Texas Del Med, um, and I'm familiar with the Hogg Foundation and really, really 
really enjoy um, working with that group of people. It's, it's an incredible foundation and organization. So something to look into also, especially for those that are local. Okay, and then treatment directories. So specifically, I wanted to touch on the LGBTQ um, plus community, the psych uh, psychotherapists of color directory, and then the national queer and trans therapists of color network. Um, I, the, the people that I work with are um, substance are addicted to substances and um, also manage HIV and AIDS. And so that community is near and dear to my heart and love. I, I just found out about the National Queer and Trans Therapists of Color Network and loved that site, loved it. So um, yeah, so there are those resources to touch on the mental health that we just spoke on and then the addiction that we spoke on, spoke on prior. Now, we move on to self-care. So food for thought. Prior to the coronavirus pandemic, black maternal mortality rates had already risen to four to five times higher than that of white women, according to the CDC. Now, in addition to the disproportionately rising death tolls of black people due to coronavirus, studies show this could impact the rate even further. There are also several that fear for the future lives of black children and how they will be viewed in the world. But let's talk about joy. Talk about what's possible for us. Talk about our greatness and our excellence, but also let's talk about just what it means to reclaim joy and exist as a black person in this time today. That is our birthright. Black people have generationally had to overlook their own emotions, pain, well-being, mental health, and trauma to take care of white people's feelings. We have had to perform in numb, this numb, strong role for so long that we forgot or perhaps didn't even realize it was necessary to take care of ourselves first and foremost. Experts advise that now is really the time to pour back into ourselves if you haven't done so in the past or already. It's time to make that time for yourself. It is paramount. Self-care, although fun, isn't just face masks, soaking in the bathtub and, and completing these scenic yoga poses, right? It isn't something that you do occasionally. Self-care is a choice to do things that speak to your heart and soul in ways that nourish you, pick you up and keep you going to face life again tomorrow. It is that thing that you do that makes you feel alive, sustains you, and fills you with gratitude. For so long, women of color have been told what self-care looks like from perspectives that are not like that of their own. While there is nothing wrong with the woman, with the woman of all walks of life spreading all kinds of self-care, for the women of color, it looks a little bit different than their counterparts particularly because self-care for us is tied into so much culturally, race, racially, politically, spiritually, and medically, it will not typically look like green smoothies and Lululemon on the beautiful beaches of the South Pacific. <laughs> In African-American communities, we are used to seeing the brown and black women taking care of everyone else's needs before their own. There is a fear that if we don't that if we don't do so, then we are labeled as selfish or uncaring by our very own people. I have seen women labeled as selfish because they prioritize the gym and their own therapy over a request of a family member that they have that has asked of them. However, women of color can be so selfless. In fact, due to this we end up taking care of ourselves, excuse me, we end up not taking care of ourselves and put others at risk and put ourselves at risk for major health and wellness concerns. Women of color have the highest risk of obesity, depression, anxiety, and heart disease because we do not take better care of ourselves and don't manage our stress, our stress appropriately. 
Uh, depression and anxiety is what I suffer from. I am diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, you know, it's one thing I hear people say all the time, oh God, I'm so OCD, I do this, I do that. It has affected my life drastically. And without therapy and medication management, I don't know where I would be today. It has caused me to lose jobs, to lose relationships, um, to lose a sense of self. Um, and then depression just falls alongside with that. Um, and it has taken a lot of, of effort and time, but I could not be happier with where I am today um, and, and can't express that enough. Um, but to go on, um, enough is enough, right? It is okay to help others but not at the cost of without help, not at the cost of helping ourselves, of not being able to help ourselves. Self-care for the women of color is a lifestyle, a daily practice. It is a reset, a recharge, a readdress, a readjust, a restart, a refocus, reclaim, reemerge, release, all of it, as much as you want, whenever the heck you want. It is putting your whole mind, body, and soul into it. Self-care for the woman of color is a radical act that goes against everything we have ever been taught to be. Here are some of my favorite self-care practices. Um, finding stillness. It is important to listen to your body and take time to process everything being experienced, especially in this hustle and bustle of this crazy world that we live in. And now COVID is involved. It's just, it's a lot. Um, so allowing yourself time to be still fully process is how we, how we access our calm mind as well as access our higher solutions. A calm mind is a powerful mind and tool. This is vital in times of challenging chaos, planning, organizing, and uprising. Spend some time, spend some part of the day centering into your power. Meditations and breathing practices are great for this. Um, there are a wide variety of virtual meditations available for free or at low cost. I am huge into YouTube. I can't even, I mean, there are so many things that you can find and I love it. Love it. Love it. Quick five, 10 minute meditations you can do before you get up after you go, or before you get up, or before you go to bed, or in the middle of the day, or whatever, but it's super helpful, and um, the Calm app, love it, love that, it costs um, money, but utilize it for the trial, and then be done, <laughs> I shouldn't be saying that, um, another thing I like to do is um, group therapy. So it's join a safe space or group therapy. This is a great way for people who haven't necessarily gotten their feet wet in therapy and want to access a free source with those alike. Um, very helpful. Uh, recently lost my mom. Well, not re well, it's still recently. It's still in the, in the first year. It's uh, her, the anniversary of her passing is March 4th. And that is right when COVID like hit last year. Um, and so what I did was join a grief support group and it has been excellent and super helpful. Um, not just for the grief purpose, but I've now made long lasting relationships for the rest of my life out of that. So it's been great. Um, move mindfully. One or more ways um, for a mental relief is to circulate the, the energy in your body around you. So it's kind of like finding your stillness, meditation, stretching, whatever that looks like for you. Um, practice self-compassion. The things we say to ourselves are not typically what we do, right? Um, so practice loving kindness, by turning understanding, love, and acceptance inward with the mirror, right? Forgive yourself for what you do and what you do not know and recognize that you are imperfectly perfect. You will continue to make mistakes. Just accept it and move on. Learn from it. Um, another one I like is reaching out. 
I am huge at reaching out because of my mental health. I think that it's important for me to, when I'm feeling a certain kind of way, I want to make sure that it is in the universe and people know what's going on around me. So I will shoot a simple text to somebody um, that I know and trust and supports me and is there for me to listen, not to talk, but to listen. And that helps me, you know, emotional pain is, is killing us slowly and, you know, stop suffering in silence, reach out. Why not? There are plenty of people out there to help utilize it, take advantage, love it, embrace it. Um, as I said earlier, it's like as a therapist, um, I know the importance of therapy and its benefits. So I have never been afraid of it. I, that's the first thing I do when I move into a, a new town is I find a therapist immediately. I do not have to have insurance because I know that I am willing to go at any length to get what it is that I need to make sure that I stay sober and that I stay healthy mentally, physically, and emotionally. I'm not perfect and I have bad days and I have good days and I have great days. Um, but without my therapist and medication management, I'm not sure where I would be today. Um, another one is in, inhabit your body. So inhabiting the body means that we live within our body, that we are present throughout the whole internal space of our body. It means that we feel that we are made of, con uh, made of a consciousness everywhere in our body. So mindful, being mindful, right? Um, I think about the senses. So, you know, stop and smell the roses. What does it look like? What is it? What, it, what are you hearing from the rose or, you know, like in the wind or something? Um, how does it feel? How does it taste? What is it? You know, um, <laughs> my five senses, I already lost it. <laughs> Sight, hearing, <laughs> touch. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, utilizing that taste, feel, um, and that will literally take you into a different place because your mind is off of whatever it is that you went into it with, right? Um, so that's really helpful. Um, set boundaries and say no. This is very, very, very difficult for people to do. <laughs> for sure. Um, cause sometimes it's a friend, sometimes it's a family member, sometimes it's your partner. Um, but we give them power to be toxic and take over our day and our life and drain us and take our energy. So it's for us, we need to learn to cut the cord. You know, you can let the people know that the impact that they have on you, you, you just can't, you can't right now and you need to love them, but it needs to be from afar. Take the time that you need. It's not forever, but it's for right now. Um, let's see. And I've had this slide up for some time. There's also this other one as well, but I wanted to be able to touch on mind. So focusing on your self-care, mind, find a great therapist, art, doodle, finger paint, dance. I have a girlfriend that takes random dance classes on Zoom and just dances around the office as a, an outlet. It's just, it's a beautiful thing. I love it. <laughs> um, belly. So drink lots of water, um, cook your favorite meals, take yourself out to eat. Body, breathing, right? Daily stretches. Love a good bath with some Epsom salt, lavender, love it. Massage. If you have the opportunity, um, the financial um, stability to do that, I highly recommend it. There are some great places in this area. Um, I splurge every, every once in a while because of the job that I do. I think um, it's helpful. Um, I carry a lot of stress on my shoulders, which most people do. So Anyways, um, and then spirit. So creating healthy boundaries. I put that one first so everybody can see that. Um, and then um, love the outlet of screaming. I have a group where 
we will, I have a couple of groups. I have one that's a silence group. I have one that is a screaming group. Um, and then I've got another one that is a laughing group. And the screaming group, it's hard for people to get involved at first, but once one person gets involved and they understand the reason why we're doing it, it is such a powerful and energetic and therapeutic piece. And you just, it's a crazy way to start the day, but a perfect way to start the day. So, um, yeah, so those are the slides. And in conclusion, we must be better physically, mentally, and emotionally for ourselves first, both when things are bad and when things are good. By practicing these things when they are good and bad, we make self-care a part of our every fiber. And when we can be better for ourselves, we can be better for others. That's all I got. I'm done. <laughs> Just. Hi, Matt. So sorry for my departure early session. So we're going to start our Q&A session. We'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible. If you'd like to speak, you can raise your hand, your virtual hand. You'll be unmuted so you can share. Remember to put any questions for our presenter in the Q&A. Now help me welcome Sarah Billingsley. Our first question is, sorry, um, this is from Charlotte Harkins and she's like, how can I get a copy of the list of the Black mental health resources? She stated that this was a struggle for her uh, when her son was diagnosed with a mental illness. I will, if you, okay, so at the, whenever, hopefully lady will go back um, but I have a slide that has my information on it and that way everybody will be able to get it and you can shoot me an email and I will shoot the entire, either the entire presentation or just the resources to you. Um, or you can, you're more than welcome to put your email in the chat and I believe I'll be able to get that from someone too, so. Okay, that's great, because that was uh, one of the other questions was about getting a copy of the slides, because some of the slides were blurry for the, some of the people on who were watching and they couldn't get right down all the numbers. So uh, if people okay. can put their names in the chat, their email addresses and things like that, then um, we can make sure that you get a copy of the uh, PowerPoint. The next question, um, you talked about cutting ties with toxic people. And so they want to know, how do you cut ties with toxic people? toxic family members and deal with the guilt? So for me, uh, and I always speak ab about my own experience and hopefully that will be helpful. But as far as um, that goes, what I have typically done in the past is um, first it's, it's staying away from them and physically and not answering calls, texts, face, whatever the case may be. And then I typically sit down and write what I would like to say to them. Um, I go over it with my therapist. <laughs> then I will typically send it in an email. I've, I've done it once before over the phone, but it's very hard to do because there's always that back and forth. So I typically just send it in an email and let them know that I need to focus on myself. And um, right now that that does not have them in the picture. And that's all in so many words. Um, and as far as the guilt goes, I work around that guilt with my therapist. Um, I'll be very honest that the people that I did step away from for some time, um, one, I don't, I still don't have a relationship with. I did not feel guilty um, because it was the best for me and my recovery. Okay, thank you. Um, next, I need to call on Chanel. It looks like she's in our Zoom. Is there a question, Ms. Chanel? Yes, I'm sorry. I had to try to unmute it. Hey, uh, Chanel. Hey, Miss Sarah. I used to work with Sarah. She's so amazing. 
<laughs> um, Sarah, I want the information because I'm starting to do groups, but I like the idea of the silence group, the screaming group, and the laughing group. So if you can please, oh, they asked me to start my video. Um, oh. I, I would, are you asking me to un show my face? It says the host asks you to start. Yes. Oh my God, my hair, I am working from <laughs> home and y'all know how we are about our head. I have a do-rag on, hold on. <laughs> oh, girl, you need to stop. <laughs> Hold on, Imani, please. I'm also trying to help my daughter. So uh -huh. um, I want to know how to do those group, groups. So if I send you my email, I guess yes, I'll go to, go to your profile, put my email in there. Can you send me the information on how to do those groups? Because they sound like they would be very, very helpful. And I would like yeah. to yeah, I can give you a call even too. Um, you have my personal number? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, cool. Thanks. <laughs> so good to see you. You too. And is your number the same? Because I think I yes. have yours. Okay, yes, okay. Okay, thank you. Oh, you look so you look, you look so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing though. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you, Miss Chanel. We do have a couple more questions that have come in through the Q&A. How can a person help a family member consider getting substance treatment? Help when the person doesn't show any interest in getting help. That is very frequent. Um, as a matter of fact, I was the exact same way. Um, as far as getting help, so there's two things that we, the family member can do, and that is look into um, Al-Anon meetings. And that is also in the information that I can send out later. And that is more so a meeting for you and getting support around family that um, is, or is, is in active addiction or is in recovery. Um, but as far as a, a family member getting them involved, I know that in the past, typically people have just given them information or sat down and talked with them or even made an appointment for them. And the family member goes and is reluctant. But once the appointment is set, um, they typically have a conversation with intake or admissions, and then they will most likely start treatment. It doesn't mean they're going to want to but um, that's been my experience in the past. Um, I know for me, my personal experience is that I, you know, I, I didn't want to go and made a big deal about it for many, many um, facilities that I was, that my family was trying to put me in. And then finally, it, I lived in Florida at the time. And for those that are um, oh, and familiar or even not familiar, they have an act called the Baker Act, the Baker Act. And so that is a law where your family member can involuntarily commit you to um, behavioral health or substance abuse addiction. So that happened a couple of times. And then the last time when I was put into substance abuse treatment, um, we would always go shopping for the school year um, and get a nice, you know, first day outfit. And so my family went to, we went to do that and come to find out in short, there was a suitcase in the trunk and I just happened to, we had a Suburban and I just happened to look in the back of it, saw a suitcase. I was like, what the heck are we doing? This is crazy. Long story short, they're like, surprise, we're taking you to treatment. So <laughs> that's how I, <laughs> that's how I was put into substance abuse treatment uh, the, the last time. Um, the, well, I don't want to say the last time. The last time was legal, pushed me into it. But one of the last times was when my family dropped me off. And I went reluctantly, finished the program, just walked the walk, did what I had to do to check things. And uh, yeah, but I came around. So here I am today. <laughs> I hope that answered your question. It was kind of all over the place. 
And there's a follow up uh, to that question. Mm -hmm. Someone asked, uh, did you need their consent to make an appointment for a family member? So when you're talking about making an appointment for a family member, do you have to have their consent to do um, so? Yeah, I have, uh, this is a very, this is a, a touchy subject. So do you need their consent? Of, of course, but do you need their consent? No, we have people that have family set up appointments. Um, however, the, the family member will still be present in the room, if that makes sense. Um, it has happened in the past. And then if it, you know, if you were to make the appointment for the family member and they're not comfortable with it, then, you know, clearly they won't come. But another thing that one can do is set the appointment. And then prior to that appointment, you can let the family member know, and then they can call and speak with our admissions office. Um, and they, they do a really, really great job at getting your loved one into treatment. I can't um, speak on other treatment facilities, but I can't speak on ours. Okay. And then another question, it says, being a part of the task force for, for your employer, does this group do active recruitment for African-American employees? And then what type are doing, what are, you, what are you guys doing to change the landscape from within? Um, right now it's slow and steady. Um, because we are right now, we, because of the pandemic, um, we restructured our um, program. So what we're doing at this point is can, we're wrapping up the um, strategic plan that we are going to be focusing on in the next few years. And so when that is done, we have been, it's been addressed by our executive director that we will be focusing more so on the equity task force. So um, it's, it's slow moving, but as far as uh, recruitment goes, yes, there has been there has been reach out or contact to the other employees and other people in the community to try to get them um, onto our um, onto our team. So again, it's slow and steady and COVID has changed us and others significantly. So um, things are looking up, things are looking up. It looks like that was the last of the questions that I have in the Q&A. Do you have any questions, Lady Jane, over there in the Zoom area at all? No, we are good. Okay. So that looked like the last of our questions. So I want to uh, thank you, Miss Sarah, for sharing your knowledge and insight with us. And many thanks to all of you for joining us today on in this session and the wonderful questions that you asked. Please take a few minutes to complete the workshop survey. It helps us know how we're doing. And if you're seeking CEUs, remember that your forms will be in the survey. The links for both are in the chat. Lady, can I ask if you can pull up my, the slide with my information by chance? Yes. And we can also email all of that to attendees. I guess, I think that would be better. Okay, that's perfect. Love it. Thank you so okay. much. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone that joined. Sonia, thank you. Lady, thank you. I will see you later. Um, have a blessed day. All right, you guys thank have you, a everyone. great day and enjoy the conference.